Hi guys, welcome to another episode of Pointy Not Sharp. Today we're going to be discussing the correct cleaning of uh, bayonets, or at least uh, my method anyway. Um, now just to clarify, by cleaning I don't mean restoration. We're not going to be uh, restoring them. By restoring a bayonet, giving it a new edge, a new blue, painting it, or anything funky like that, you're going to be devaluing it and uh, effectively destroying it. And if you want to sell it, you're not going to get a good price for it. Um, in my mind, well, yeah, we, we own the bayonets that are our property. They're going to be around a lot longer than us. They are antiques, and at the end of the day, we're only custodians of them. We're uh, looking after them and preserving them for the next generation and the generation after that. Uh, like a lot of the bayonets I have in my collection from the 1800s, and uh, <laughs> they've gone through quite a few hands before they've made their way to me, and hopefully quite a few hands after me as well. Anyway, to the uh, topic of the video, I'm going to break it down into four stages. So the first stage will be disassembly. The second stage will be cleaning. The third stage will be preservation. And the fourth stage will be reassembly. Now, at the start of each stage, I'll go through the uh, required materials. But um, I'll start with the disassembly. Now, as you can see, I've got a P1907 here before me. Uh, when you're disassembling a bayonet, always try to use uh, the best tools you can or the uh, the original tools if they're available. Um, I'm lucky enough to have one of the original tools here for removing the press stud. I understand that's uh, not a luxury most people have. Most people are just going to be using your garden variety screwdrivers and uh, tools they have around the house. Um, please don't ever use power tools. Power tools will destroy bayonets so quick. Uh, I don't know how many bayonets I've got that people have taken power tools to and just absolutely mangled. Uh, so please, no grinders, no power drills or anything like that. Anyway, for uh, disassembly, um, just to clarify, I also often use a hammer and one of these bad boys to soften the blow from the hammer. Sorry, it's got a bit of clutter around my desk. I'll move it so I can get a bit closer. Now... When disassembling a bayonet, generally there's not too much you can take off. Generally you're looking at your press stud, your grips, and occasionally another kind of feature like, I don't know, something on a scabbard, but uh, maybe taking the mouth out of a scabbard or something like that. But generally there's not too much to disassemble. So with the P1907 here, generally you can remove the screws, the grips, and the press button. Now, the way I'd go about doing that is in no particular order. First, I'd remove the screws. Full disclosure, I've actually removed the reverse of this already because it was incredibly stiff and it probably took about, ah, come on through, half an hour to get them off before. And it'd be embarrassing if I can't get just half the grip off now. But uh, make sure you use the right size screwdriver. Don't use something too big and try to force it in. Uh, these screws can have a couple of different sizes. This one has a bigger hole, but quite a few of them require quite a fine screwdriver. Don't force something too big in there. Don't use the wrong size, because when you turn it and it's quite stiff, you're just gonna mangle it. Now these grips, um, quite often, they will be stuck in place. Uh, there's nothing holding them in place. They just slide up or down or peel straight out, but over the years, they've absorbed oil, moisture, they've swollen up. Uh, maybe there's a bit of corrosion behind them that's holding them in place. So while sometimes you can just push them off, often you have to hammer them off. So grab a nice cloth for softening the blows, grab a hammer, just give it a couple of taps up and down. This one's not moving too quick. There we go. That's just peeled off. And as I've said, got a little bit of corrosion under there, so it was a little stiff and a little difficult to remove because of that. Now, move that to the side. Give me one second, I'll grab my other grip as well. I'll place it there. I've got two little nuts that sit on the back. Now to remove the press stud, you either need a specialist tool or you can make your own. I've seen people who've gotten a very, very large screwdriver. They've ground out the middle and then sand it or fold the sides down so they're nice and soft and they're not going to damage the surface. They're not going to leave tool marks. But it's quite a simple affair. Just unscrew the button. 
off he comes. Underneath we get a spring. Let you come. And then our little stub on the other side. And that's it, that's the complete disassembly of a P1907. Okay, so the second phase uh, is cleaning. Now, generally what I use for cleaning is I might have uh, a chuck cloth, maybe some paper towel. Uh, generally I use an old army rank slider, a bit of cloth to apply oil. I'll have a bit of gun oil, motor oil works pretty well too. Um, more of a preservation thing, but uh, gun oil does evaporate reasonably quick compared to motor oil, which will sit there for months. And finally, I use my steel wool. Uh, for steel wool, I use a very, very super fine. So I use the uh, 0000 grade steel wool. Uh, I was actually chatting to a guy who restores uh, ceremonial and uh, commissioned officers sorts, or not restores, sorry, he um, maintains them for, uh, a, uh, for the Defence Force. And um, he was saying that pretty much his job is to sit there with a sword for four hours at a time with some wool, some oil, and um, a lot of effort and just clean it up as best you can. And uh, if that's what they do, if that's what a professional does, it's good enough for me. Anyway, so the way I go about um, removing corrosion or just generally cleaning the bayonet up, just apply a bit of oil to my cloth. Apply the oil, let it sink in. Generally a lot of the corrosion will come up just with the oil and the cloth alone. And then I'll clean up the rest of it with the steel wool. And if I need to repeat this two or three times, fine. But as you can see, that's coming up pretty good already. Like most of that corrosion's already gone. And I've got some markings coming in pretty nicely that I hadn't previously seen. Got a nice little Lithgow star on this one, actually, I didn't see that before. So that's generally how I go about removing corrosion. Um, it's not very destructive or very um, uh, painful on the, the bayonet. Uh, it is a bit painful on yourself because it can be a lot of time. Now that's uh, removing corrosion. Where is it? I've got a Bertier here, uh, model 1892 French bayonet. You'll notice it's got a lot of black markings along the blade. Uh, you can get these out through the same method. It does take a very, very, very long time. Similarly, this one, someone has taken a angle grinder to the tip. So if I get the lighting just right, you can sort of make that out. And they've done a horrible job on it. Uh, I'm not a fan of what they've done. But bit by bit, I'm just hitting it with the steel wool every now and then, just trying to get rid of as many of those marks as I can. So yeah, you can really put in a lot of time and get a really nice polish on something like this. But honestly, I'd much rather leave it in uh, this condition. So I've got no issue leaving um, bayonets a little marked. I prefer the original condition. I don't want to damage them or take off any extra uh, layers or patinas or blues or anything like that. Also, when I'm uh, oiling, uh, if I can't disassemble a grip like this one here, you'll notice it's got uh, rivets instead of screws. Um, I can't remove that, so I won't be applying oil onto the wood because you don't know what the oil is going to do to the wood. It might darken it. Uh, this one's already very, very dark. It's probably got a lot of oil. And while you can draw some oil out with a hairdryer and wiping it away, generally I just try to avoid getting the oil on the wood to begin with. The same with um, hot soapy water. So if I'm cleaning Cosmoline off of a bayonet, as per my previous video, which I highly recommend you watch, it's a good one. Uh, I won't get the uh, hot soapy water anywhere near the grips either, because I don't want the um, the wooden grips absorbing it. God knows how long that moisture is going to be trapped in there. Um, anyway, guys, uh, that's generally uh, how I clean. I might apply some. Uh, oil to the length and just wipe it away with a chucks cloth or paper towel. Still got a bit coming up there so it needs a bit more of a clean. And I've got my little pull throughs and toothbrushes to get in all the little nooks and crannies. So pull through is great for getting in the, uh, the press button hole, little screw holes, inspection hole, in around the Maltese. 
then the um, individual pieces themselves, just give them an oil and uh, these are already a bit oily. Just chuck them on the cloth, rub them down. Steel wool if you need it, if there's a little bit of corrosion. And generally I don't do too much more for cleaning. Um, I don't really want to um, do too much to them. I don't want to destroy them. I don't want to damage them. Uh, generally I'm happy to keep them in a very similar condition. I've got them just a little cleaner and without corrosion. The uh, third step is uh, preservation. When I'm preserving bayonets, generally um, I treat each of the individual components differently. So the metal I'll apply, if it's a newer bayonet, uh, gun oil or motor oil. Uh, gun oil doesn't last nearly as long as motor oil. Motor oil will last for months and months and months where the gun oil will evaporate reasonably quick. Um, if it is an older bayonet like my Bertier here though, instead of gun oil, I'll apply Renaissance Wax. Uh, it costs a little bit of money, but it's probably the best stuff you can get your hands on for preserving anything. Uh, they use it in the, uh, the museums in England. It was originally developed for, um, what do they say here, restoration specialists to revive, protect valuable furniture, leather, paintings, metals, marble, anything. So this stuff's fantastic, but it does cost a fair bit, like a hundred bucks for um, a tin this big. And it doesn't go as far as you'd think, unfortunately. So that's how I'd um, preserve the, uh, the metallic components. In terms of uh, wood, I'd find a good linseed oil. I don't have one at the moment. Uh, I was just about to go get some before this video, but I forgot. And um, generally I'll get a lighter one that's not going to darken or mark the wood. And um, before I apply it, I might test a little bit on the underside. So I'll give it a good scrub down first with a toothbrush and maybe some, um, some water, not too much, just to clean it up. And uh, apply a little bit, a little bit of linseed oil to the underside, make sure it doesn't mark. Give it a bit of time. If I'm happy with the outcome and it needs it, um, I'll give it a, a quick oil. If it doesn't uh, need it like this one doesn't really, I'll leave it alone. And um, finally, leather. So let me grab a leather scabbard. This one's not a great example because it's got a, a coating on it, but um, for leather. Generally, I apply cellular gel. Make sure the lid's on before I tilt it. So this stuff uh, stops your red rot in leather and uh, preserves it, provides like a, a layer of protection on the outside and traps any moisture inside. Because you want a little bit of moisture inside your leather at the end of the day, uh, it's pretty much just skin or it is skin. You don't want it to dry out and crack. And uh, cellular gel is just a great little product I use for that. But again, it's very, very expensive. I've read you can use moisturizer pretty well, but I haven't played around with that myself. Uh, anyway, um, if I don't need to apply anything to the leather, it's in reasonably good condition. I'm not going to mess with it and risk damaging it further because you never know. Like Sully Gel, I haven't had any issues with it, but I have read of uh, other people have had it dark in their lighter brown leathers. So if I don't absolutely have to use it, I won't. And uh, generally, that's as far as I go with... Um, preservation. Uh, I don't like to mess with things too much because uh, I don't want to damage or break anything. Finally, reassembly. Um, same tools as I use for disassembly, just it, doing the exact same thing, I just did in reverse order. Uh, making sure I'm not damaging anything when I'm putting it together, exactly the same, using the same, uh, same tools, the correct tools. I probably should have said this back at the start, I cheated, I've already put this in, just screwing it in. Um, if you're not sure that you can get something apart or you're worried you might damage it, don't even try disassembling it because likely you're going to do more damage than good. You might have the intention of giving a, the inside of a press stud a nice little clean or something like that and you might um, completely damage it in the, the process. So it's probably not worth trying uh, if you're not 100% confident and you don't know what you're doing. Now at the end of the day, I'm not a tradesman. I'm not an expert in uh, cleaning, preservation, disassembly, reassembly, so feel free to critique me as much as you can. I know there's gonna be some uh, experts out there with uh, a lot more knowledge, a lot more skill than me, but uh, this is just at the basic level and this is as far as I go when I'm um, maintaining my collection and um, cleaning up a mate's when he hands them over to me and asks for a hand. Anyway guys, uh, if you have anything further you'd like to add, comment below, I'd love to hear from you and thanks for watching.